Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm going to give a talk on the Selenium Security Scanner. And uh, it was pointed out to me that last year at the Selenium Conference in London, someone else gave a very similar talk. And we have a unique spin on ours, but just to give you guys some new content and some fresh content, I also wanted to speak about something else today. So I'll kind of divide this half an hour into two separate talks. And we can do a little Q&A in between. And um, hopefully, we can get some engagement from you all and some questions that are support the talk, right? So I want to talk about perfect testing pyramids. And what I mean by a perfect testing pyramid is if you look at a new feature that you're going to add to your web application, how can you write the correct tests? How can you use appropriate frameworks? And how can you think really beyond releasing the feature to uh, maybe five, six, seven years out of what's the end of life for your test? And uh, where are these tests going to live? And how long are they going to run for? And how can we get coverage in the right way? So I think everyone's seen this before, the perfect UI testing pyramid or perfect testing pyramid period. Um, but if you think about you know, what's what, what is in the testing pyramid? What goes at the top? What goes at the bottom? Usually it was just you know, unit tests at the bottom and Selenium tests at the top. And I think you could even go beyond that. I think you can say that there is a, a pyramid test for UI, that there's lower levels of UI testing that we're not necessarily doing or always thinking about. So maybe this entire Selenium framework is sort of the, the top of that automated GUI tests. But when you're operating at Salesforce's scale, you know, we have about uh, 1,000 engineers. And 600 of them are development engineers. 400 of them are quality engineers. We end up writing a lot of automated GUI tests, which each takes about a minute to run. And so that's why, if you saw our talk yesterday, why we need that gigantic infrastructure to run all those tests and all those sub runs and that very expensive, very complicated infrastructure. So what if we just started doing testing without the DOM? in some cases. Um, what exactly does that mean? Or what is at the bottom of a UI testing pyramid? And we think it's JavaScript tests and JavaScript unit tests. And so as we get more mature as a software delivery organization, we start to ask as quality engineers from the, from the developers on the team, hey, would you also, when you're writing JavaScript, would you also write some tests for those or some specs for those? Because it will reduce the Selenium testing burden that we have. And when you get into very complicated UI pages, um, let's say you made a page object and you made you know, five API methods on it, um, you could get to a point where if you're testing almost the same thing every single time in a row. So maybe a good example is if you had a post that had a like button on it or something, and it had an unlike button, and you write two Selenium tests for that, you're sort of walking through the same code path over and over again, and you're not really even testing the layout anymore, and you're not testing anything else. You're testing JavaScript at that point. And so there's ways to achieve that coverage at the JavaScript level, or the JavaScript layer. And so we came up with a framework that we've open sourced called xunit.js. And there's no reason to use ours in particular. Um, you can use Jasmine or anything else. I think what's unique about ours is that we invested some time um, making sure that this framework also had a runner that would take the same script and the same spec and run it on multiple JavaScript engines. So we can get coverage in Firefox's Spider Monkey. I think the latest revision of that is called Ion Monkey. We can get coverage in Google's V8 engine for how these scripts behave. And we can get coverage also, since we have um, a lot of former Microsoft engineers up in Seattle, in IE Script Engine, which I think covers IE7 and IE8 for the engine that we pulled out. And so that's pretty cool to get to get the coverage in different ways. And what's great about it is that those tests run in under 10 milliseconds, which is fantastic for us. So essentially, you can write a, a thousand tests that are running in seconds. In some cases, it takes longer to, to parse the build script and for that to warm up than it does to actually run every JavaScript test that we have. So then you can take that test run and put it into a pre-commit system. Or as you're developing things and as you're fixing things in the application, fixing bugs or adding features, you can actually run tons of UI tests, thousands of UI tests before you check in, almost imperceptibly. So that, that framework is called xunit.js, and that's something that um, we're starting to invest a lot more in, and starting to flirt with adding that to our definition of done, and it's starting to become an expectation on certain teams that when you write JavaScript, you write some tests with it. So 
So this is what a JavaScript unit test looks like. So um, let's say we had a feature that was for chatter. So there'd be something called you know, chatter.js, and then we'd have something else called chatterspec.js. And a fixture is like a suite, and a fact is like a test. And so it starts off really easy. We use this pattern called the arrange act assert pattern, and you can look that up later, but it's a, a pretty good way of doing tests in, in this kind of language. And so this is a very naive example. All it does is take a string or some white space and then trim it, and it makes sure that your um, custom function is working properly. But where it gets difficult is that you don't want to load every single script into the engine. So this spec by itself will have a dependency or an import. So if it was chatter spec.js, you'd have a dependency on chatter.js, and you load those two things into the JavaScript engine. But you don't want to load everything beyond that. You don't want to load your entire app into the engine because it's no longer a unit test. You don't want to test the thing that's right next to it. So you have to go through and start doing some mocking. And that's where it gets complicated or difficult. That's why most people don't do this because that's hard. But, you know, a lot of JavaScript, you may not think of it as application code, but it really is, especially in a SaaS application where so much of the client experience is what they see in the browser and what happens on the mobile device. So if you don't write your JavaScript to be testable, or if you don't think about it as application code, you may not write tests for it, or you may not make it testable to start with. And so the, the mocking can really be difficult, meaning you might spend two or three hours just writing mocks before you can actually write one very simple test. But once you've broken through that barrier, what you now have is excellent coverage for your page without having written a single Selenium test yet. And so when you think about a really big application like Salesforce, which has almost 2,000 pages, um, it's really great if you can get covered to some of these lower levels so that you, know, you don't have to add the 50,000 and first Selenium test. When you think about what happens when your software organization has a much, much bigger application and you've been writing Selenium tests for over five years, how big is your inventory? What do you do with older tests? And how do you have enough CPU to run these things? It's kind of a quadratic problem. So if you think about what a new UI automation strategy is, at the bottom of your pyramid, you have script developers also writing JavaScript unit tests with their feature. And then in the middle, and the middle's pretty wide, right? You can have things that are much lower. Like you can have PhantomJS, which is effectively a JavaScript engine with a DOM tree or access to all of the DOM API. Um, or even at the middle top, you can have something that's maybe like HTML unit, right, where you're running a headless browser or we've been flirted with um, various experiments where we take Firefox or Chrome and we run it in a headless mode. We run it like an XFBB where it's not really rendering to a screen and painting a bitmap so that it runs faster. Um, so these are other ways of getting lower level testing. And then right now when we do web driver tests, what we're trying to do always is test for browser compatibility. Um, Salesforce supports seven browsers and we try to be as client agnostic as possible since we support a lot of enterprise customers, upper half of our traffic comes from Internet Explorer. And so what we want to make sure is that that experience is extremely consistent across all of those browsers. And we think it's a pretty cool um, innovation, especially at the bottom of the pyramid, to be able to get coverage in these different kinds of browsers, even just with a JavaScript test. And so our requirement is that we try not to have you know, new web driver, new Selenium tests, that would, let's say, only run in Chrome or only run in Firefox. We really want to make sure that we're getting the same result out of every browser that our clients and customers use. So are people pretty familiar with this, or is anyone else doing this at their company, or do you have any questions about what I've just presented here? Go ahead. Um, sometimes it's difficult to write a unit test if you didn't actually write the piece of functionality. Um, it, it's very much you're thinking, and if you're doing it TDD, maybe you'd write the spec first and then write the implementation second. And so um, if you're an organization that really likes pair programming, sometimes it's good to have the quality engineer and the developer sitting together and talking through you know, what, what they're making this sprint or what they're making this week. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to just have someone dump out 
you know, a couple hundred line JavaScript file and then try and unit test it afterwards. You have to sort of design it with testing in mind or it becomes difficult. Um, and I think people are just starting to wrap their heads around, you know, building interfaces in JavaScript and building sort of a testable API in JavaScript when you're making new code there. Um, but, but certainly I think that, you know, if you've embraced page objects and WebDriver that you can also as a QE start working down from the top, right? That you can have something that runs very fast in HTML unit um, and just get, get, get faster, less CPU intensive coverage. Because no one wants to wait two, three hours for a Selenium run to come back. It's good to get feedback before things end up in master or mainline or some shared branch. Cool, so now I'll go on to the Selenium security scanner. So um, again, this is something that someone in, who presented at London last year did something really similar, but we have our own spin on it, and I'll try and speak to that a little bit. So essentially what this is, is we want to find common security errors in our applications by doing active and dynamic scans. And essentially you need, we're going to use, in this case, Selenium as an input to the security scanner in order to traverse the entire app. So if you've written Selenium tests that cover every page in your application, you can essentially use that Selenium test run to drive traffic or drive a pointer to every single piece of the application itself. And the way we capture that is with a, a local proxy. So you know, in the, when you're setting up a web driver, you can actually say, point all traffic to this proxy to get out to the internet. And then what that actually is is a recording proxy. And so every HTTP request and every HTTP response is put into a queue. And then when the Selenium run is finished, we can actually replay those HTTP requests and then fuzz the inputs. So um, I'll talk about the classes of vulnerabilities that can catch, but in other words, you can try and do things that, that a hacker would do. So let me just take a step back and talk a little bit about you know, a couple of common vulnerabilities just um, so that we have a common language about what kinds of things we're trying to fix or find. Does anyone know what cross-site scripting is? Okay. Um, so, you know, as quality engineers, you might not always think about you know, th these security problems. You think that there'll be a security expert or someone on your team or a consultant that will figure this out and find this out for you. But I think that um, as guardians of the release and as guardians of a very high quality code base, we should be actively looking for security problems before we say it's okay to release. I don't know. How many people here are empowered to block a release if it's not of high quality? Who, who's done that before and been the least popular person at work? <laughs> and so we don't often think about you know, security problems as being a part of that, but you know, a lot of your customers, especially if you're SaaS, they're really trusting you to um, guard their data and, and to not have it be prone to hackers, even if it's a, uh, even if it's you know, not specifically your fault or something else happens, it's just that the web changes so much that we need to really be actively looking for these things and to prevent them from going to production. And so um, cross-site scripting has a few different vectors, a few different ways that it can show up. Um, it can be reflected, meaning you give some input to the server and it sort of plays it back to you and it, effectively your browser will execute something that is a script when it wasn't supposed to. It was supposed to treat it as something else. Or there can be something stored. So like if, you, if your website is a programmatic platform and you give it some input and then it's playing it back to multiple users multiple times. So on some other stateless request, you come back to it and you, you get this, this thing that executes as a script. Um, and then another big common class of vulnerabilities is cross-site request forgeries. So this would be like, let's say that someone in the audience here was logged into um, PayPal and then I go ahead and send you a link in an email and you click it and then it transfers money to me from your account. So I'm effectively making you make a request to some place that you're authenticated to and it's gonna perform some action that benefits me in some way or that screws up your data. So we don't want either one of these things to happen. So the, the security scanner, these are just two things that I can find. I can find many, many other things. And so I'm just gonna walk through sort of the way it works or the different pieces that you need to set this up yourself. And, um, while our pieces aren't open source, there are other ways that you can do this, um, including the one that was presented at London last year, if you look up that talk. So what we do is we, number one, start up our application server. Um, number two, we want to actually set up or stand up this proxy 
itself so that we can record the traffic as it goes out. And then we also want to start up our Selenium proxy. And so the way these processes talk is over Java remote method invocation or Java RMI. So you'll have effectively the, the burp server um, calling back to uh, the other server and saying, go ahead and, and run these tests for me, run these Selenium tests so that I can record the input of them. And then on the server itself, um, or the application server itself, we can then use the Selenium input and use the recorded requests to try and, uh, in parallel, run over each one of those requests. And so if we saw different headers and different parameters and different things being passed in posts, let's say, HTTP posts, we'd be able to kind of fuzz each input. And then when we get the request back, we sort of compare, was this the same or similar to the request that was seen the first time? And also, if we tried to inject a script or something in there, um, did we see that script play back to us? And so th th this is all not perfect. Um, you know, th there are certain problems with when you try and do this that you'll have to work through. And they're all very solvable or fixable. So one thing is, if you've done a great job and if you've put cross-site request forgery tokens on different APIs and um, servlets on your application server, that these will actually stop your Selenium run. So the next time you play it back, it'll go, this token is not valid, and it'll kick you out and then the Selenium run. So, you know, in some cases you may um, have to turn it off or figure some way around that so that the test can actually run or so that you can actually do the traversal of the entire application itself. Um, just using raw Selenium by itself, you know, many times there's extra steps and extra code paths and extra execution in there that can interrupt the run or end it early. Let's say something flaps or fails in Selenium, then you won't really get a full recording. You won't be able to get through the entire app. And so, again, there's ways around that. You can catch the JUnit assertion errors and sort of ignore them. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if you had a two-hour Selenium run, um, effectively running this again, running this kind of system, you'll end up with a four-hour Selenium run at least. So it's basically a double because it has to do it once and then it has to do it again to fuzz the inputs. Um, in our case, we picked a certain kind of proxy. I think we had to get a license from them, so that was, you know, a cost or a hurdle. Um, and then, really, the, the most important thing here, the reason that, you know, that this is state of the art or different than other, that the other people are doing, or something that you guys should consider doing, is that anyone can have a security team um, run these kinds of tests before you release. But if you can get them into the CI loop, and if they can be running multiple times a day on every change list and every line, you know, patch, freeze, release, whatever you have, the main trunk, um, you can start to catch these failures all over the place. And so you don't end up with regressions because you put it into the CI loop. Um, another challenge we're working through is just, you know, consolidating the number of processes that start and making it a little bit less clunky. You know, there's certain processes that you can merge together. You can have sort of one application server do things rather than do it over Java RMI. Although that's a modular way of keeping your, your pieces of code separate, your test code separate from your application code. Um, so are there any questions about this? So is this solution with other all aspects of technical testing, or is it going to be different from the system? Um, so that, that there's different things you could do it in an active scanner. We can talk a little bit afterwards about them. But th those are just two examples of, of things that you can catch. OK, thank you, everyone.